Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our conversation with Richard Haas and Kevin Perino. My name is Paige Berger, and I'm the marketing manager here at Barrett Bookstore. We're thrilled to welcome you to this conversation tonight. And we're so grateful that you can join us to celebrate the release of Richard's new book, The World. Before I go any further, I'd like to give some special recognition to our partners at the Darien Community Association. We planned this event back in January with them. And while we're very disappointed we can't gather in the DCA's beautiful space, we are so grateful for our continued partnership with this wonderful community institution. Uh, the DCA has been an incredible partner throughout this planning process, from setting up the registration to sending reminder emails. And in particular, I'd like to thank Amy Bell and her entire team. Uh, in addition, I'd like to thank the DCA board who continues to support our work at the bookstore. And we look forward to many wonderful events to come and to the day that we can gather together again. A few housekeeping notes before we go further. For those of you who have not used the Crowdcast platform before, this is a webinar platform. That means we can't see you. Um, there are two ways for you to engage in conversation. Some of you are already chatting on the sidebar, uh, and you can continue to do that throughout the presentation. I also want to call to attention the fact that there is a, a, a little link at the bottom that says, ask a question. And if you have any questions you would like to pose to Richard during the conversation, you're welcome to put them there. Kevin will um, be engaging with Richard in conversation for the first part of the presentation, and then he will be taking questions from the audience. So at any time, if anything sparks your interest or you'd like to ask Richard something, please go ahead and put the question there, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. I'd now like to introduce Kevin Perino. Kevin is the executive director of the J Heritage Center and a veteran foreign correspondent who has reported from around the world. He was a senior writer and bureau chief for Newsweek for over a decade. He was a finalist for the Livingston Award for Foreign Reporting and a part of the team that won the National Magazine Award in 2004. He is the author of Lincoln in the World, The Making of a Statesman, and A Force So Swift, Mao, Truman, and the Birth of Modern China, 1949, which was selected as an editor's choice by the New York Times Book Review and won the 2018 Harry S. Truman Presidential, um, excuse me, Book Award uh, from the Truman Presidential Library. We're so grateful that he has agreed to join us this evening, and I'm going to bring him up on screen now. Hi, Paige. Hi, Kevin. And I'm going to disappear. OK. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and um, I, I wish we could do this in person. Um, getting a little feedback, so I'm going to turn this down. Um, I wish we could do this in person, but this is going to be a lot of fun tonight. And um, we're we have a great conversation with Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. And I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time introducing him. I think you know uh, who he is. Um, uh, and uh, I know you, you want to get uh, right to your questions pretty soon. I, I saw, as soon as I logged in, I saw a question pop up on the bottom. Uh, and it said, um, how, how does the sound work on this thing? So people were already starting to get the, the questions coming in, but um, I thought we would talk for about 30 minutes and then uh, and then Richard will answer your questions. Um, so just very briefly, Richard um, uh, is uh, he's a former Rhodes Scholar. Um, he was an uh, incredible career as a diplomat, was a uh, special assistant to George H.W. Bush, um, was the, as a, a junior NSC staffer, was the, uh, the person who briefed President Bush um, as he got the news that Iraq had invaded Kuwait. Um, then in 2003, he was working in the State Department as Director of Policy Planning um, at, during the, uh, the invasion of Iraq. He was one of the, the few officials who opposed the war in Iraq. Um, you see him now on, on Morning Joe all the time. He's, of course, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's written like 100 books. How many books have you written, Richard? There's so many, um, and his new one um, uh, is excellent. It's called the, wor the World, A Brief Introduction, um, and it's really, it's a, it's a primer on international relations, and as I was reading it, 
I was thinking, you know, what a great book it would be for a, a graduate. I mean, you guys have all, I think as part of your ticket price, you get a copy of the book, but um, it, it's a terrific primer for, uh, for a graduation gift for somebody who, you know, a student who's interested in history uh, or economics or politics or international affairs. Um, and so I hope you go to... So Thanks. Kevin, I'm so sorry, but just there is some feedback on your end that we didn't detect before. Can you just double check you're only open in one window is sometimes the issue if you have two windows open. And is that better? That's much better. Perfect. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're on now. So Okay. For John. Okay, great. Okay. So um uh anyway, the book the World by Richard Haas. And um, so please welcome Richard Haas. Hi, Richard. Oh, I don't hear you now. We're good. Okay, now we're good. Great. Okay, well, welcome. Um, so I, I was struck, Richard, by a quote you had um, at the end of the book. You said, um, the U.S. can't be an example to others around the world or promote order um, abroad if it's divided at home. And boy, I mean, we are we couldn't be more divided uh, at home right now. General Mattis yesterday uh, said President Trump is intentionally dividing Americans. Um, and so I, my question is, are we still an example for the rest of the world? And if so, what kind of example are we? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for doing this. And thanks to uh, Barrett for having me. Uh, well, we're not the kind of example we should be or could be, to put it bluntly. Uh, it's important because uh, one of the ways you have influence in the world is by the example you set. Uh, you want people to want to emulate you and how we've mishandled the COVID-19 challenge. Uh, what's happened in the killing of uh, George Floyd, what happened Monday night in Lafayette Park. Uh, none of those things is an image we should be uh, sending to the world. None of those things should be happening, full stop. Uh, it makes it impossible for us to criticize others. Uh, what China's doing in Hong Kong uh, makes it very hard for us to, to seize the high ground. Uh, it alienates our, our allies. Uh, so, and also what I worry about is we have all these challenges and I'm worried that we're going to turn inward. There's going to be a real sense that we have to deal with we have the problems we have at home. That's true. We have to. We need to root out racism. We need to deal with public health. Uh, we need to protect political rights. I get all that, obviously. Uh, but the world's not going to basically say, OK, you Americans go off and have a couple of years to sort yourself out. When you're ready, we'll be here for you. It doesn't work that way. And uh, so one of the lessons of the pandemic and you know, what happened in Wuhan didn't stay in Wuhan. We have got to stay engaged in the world at the same time we deal with our real domestic challenges. You know, one image that I find useful, at least, Kevin, is that the country's security is a coin with two sides. There's the international side, and we've learned on 9-11 or with the pandemic, that can be a threat. And we've got the domestic side, and we've obviously learned that can, that can uh, go badly. We've got to deal with both. It can't be either or. Okay. Um, in what specific ways do you think countries are kind of probing American weaknesses right now, trying to take advantage of, of distraction in here and we don't have proof, but there's things going on. We, I already mentioned Hong Kong. We have the Chinese seem to be making probes along their border with India. The Chinese officials are making much more bellicose comments about their claims to, to Taiwan. Uh, Russia has been challenging all sorts of American uh, air, airplanes and ships in international space, kind of muscling its way around the... Uh, the globe, it obviously hasn't let up in Ukraine or, or Georgia. There's no evidence it's let up in trying to interfere in our political space and our elections. North Korea continues to go down the path of uh, nuclear and missile production. Iran is pushing at the edges. It's already going beyond the edges. Let me, let me rephrase that, of its obligations under the 2015 uh, agreement. We don't know what other things might be uh, in the works. But if you're a foe of the United States, if you wish us ill and you watch what's going on, you'd have to say this is a country that's been laid low by the virus. You've got, what, 42 million people now unemployed. We have 
you know, protests in the streets uh, in over 100 American uh, cities. So if you ever wanted to uh, find a time when the United States was divided and distraction, distracted, you'd be hard put to find a better time than the, than the present. Right. You mentioned, I mean, there have been some in the Chinese media who've compared the protesters in Minneapolis to the protesters in Hong Kong, as you said. There's, um, uh, uh, are, are there parts of the world, though, that might be seeing the protests as an example of healthy democratic impulse? Only in the sense that the protests are that, but that gets working against that is what led to it. The killing of George Floyd and four policemen have now been charged. It's not the first time we've seen something uh, horrific like that. We've seen the uh, arson and the looting on the part of uh, some of those protesting. We've seen police action, including in New York City, that uh, is unwarranted. And then again, we saw what happened in Lafayette Park. We saw uniformed military uh, in, 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 in our nation's capital and the Secretary of Defense calling an Amer American city a battle space. Uh, so I don't see on balance that this is an advertisement for democracy, just the opposite. I think a lot of authoritarian countries like China uh, look at things like that and point to things like this. In the Middle East, the same thing. And they basically say, look what happens with democracy. Democracy is chaotic. It's, it's an anarchic. We can't afford that. And that becomes a rationale for them repressing their own people. I feel like sometimes I, I want to step back for just a minute. Um, I mean, I feel like sometimes in times like these, it's very, I mean, we're all kind of caught up with, you know, I mean, it's crazy, right? We're caught up with our work. We're caught up with family life. We're caught up with domestic politics. What's, I mean, your, your book is really a case for global literacy. So what's the, what's the case to be made for, why should ordinary people care about who aren't professional diplomats care about um, this kind of stuff? It's a great question. It's the question that led me to write this book because it's a primer. It's a book for normal people who have other jobs, whether it's lawyers or doctors, or they work on an assembly line, they're teachers, they work in, they work, uh, in hospitals, they're first responders, what have you. Uh, could be students, and they could be flute majors or computer majors. This is not, I mean, I'd be happy if would-be diplomats read this book, but uh, I wouldn't sell very many copies if I were only targeting would-be uh, would uh, diplomats. Let's just take a step back. I mean, again, think where we are, the pandemic. If you ever needed a graphic demonstration of why the world matters, this is it. Uh, I think uh, no, virtually no American heard of Wuhan. Now uh, we have, and we've paid a cost. 9-11, uh, terrorists operating out of remote Afghanistan, 3,000 people in this country killed in, in, a, single, in a single day. Climate change uh, doesn't respect borders. It comes from all over the world. And you know the, the destruction of the, of the Amazon rainforest in the Brazil in Brazil could have catastrophic consequences for the world, including for the United uh, States. We already mentioned Russian interference in our elections. And what this tells me is that these two oceans around us are not moats. Uh, borders are hardly impermeable. You know we can we can talk about sovereignty, and the president often does, but sovereignty is not a barrier. Sovereignty doesn't necessarily keep people or things uh, or greenhouse gases or viruses, be they computer viruses or real ones, out of the uh, United States. So essentially, the world matters. And my argument is that the average American needs to know about it. I mean, this November, in five months, we are going to have the option of voting. I hope everybody does it. What would be great, though, if they were informed when they voted? And they looked at the stances of the candidates and they had the background to judge whether that makes sense, whether that would be good. You work in a, a car factory and someone says, the president or someone says, uh, I'm, I'm going to impose steel tariffs. Well, is that something you should support or, or not? So there's those investing. Do you want to invest in certain places, business? Uh, should I have a plant in this or that country? Is it safe? Uh, do I want to have plants anywhere? Or do I want to only build in this country, even if it's more uh, expensive? Should I travel somewhere? A younger person making a career decision. Should I go into the military, the intelligence community, the foreign service? Should I join uh, some NGO? Should I go join Doctors Without Borders or the International Rescue Committee? Should I do what you do? Should I become a journalist that covers the, uh, 
come out. So my my goal in writing this book was to give people the background and the foundation to give them the history and introduction to the world's regions and introduction to global challenges that a feeling, a sense of how the world works, not that they would be ready to be secretary of state, uh, but that they would simply have the foundation and the background they needed to make informed choices, either about politics or about their own life. Um, I was struck in the book. Um, I mean, it had to, I think the book was out in May, right? So it had to have yeah, gone to bed. Ago. Pardon me? Came out three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, right? So, um, you know, it had to have gone to bed a little bit before the pandemic, um, you know, took over everything. But you you warn of, of the pandemic in the book. And, it, you know, it was clearly written before, before all this, but you warn that, you know, you saw that this was a risk. You even mentioned the the Spanish flu um, pandemic, and that this is something that um, that um, that's likely to happen. Um, and I'm just wondering if is are you seeing are you seeing or do you think the pandemic is likely to strengthen autocrats across the world, or is it likely to embolden opposition movements? Because you also see you see like Alexei Navalny in Russia, who's got, he's tripled his number of YouTube followers. And maybe they're symbiotic. I don't know, but I'm curious what you think about that. I think it all depends upon the quality of the leadership. And let me explain. If someone's in power and they handle the pandemic well, then I think it helps them. And we've seen that, for example, Chancellor Merkel's ratings in Germany have gone way up. Uh, President Moon's ratings in South Korea have gone up. President Tsai's reading, uh, ratings in uh, Taiwan have gone up and so forth. And where people do poorly, uh, their ratings go down. And what, what's so interesting is we've seen successful authoritarian regimes. Vietnam has been fantastically successful. And we've seen unsuccessful, including Russia and Iran, two authoritarian regimes that have bungled it. We've seen democracies in the United, the United States. We've done, I think, terribly. It was inevitable the pandemic was going to reach here or the virus was going to reach it. It was by no means inevitable. It was going to take the toll that, that it has. I see what's going on in Brazil. Terrible. I see what's going on in Mexico. Get, getting worse by the, the day. So what's interesting, what it shows is uh, there's no pattern in the sense that uh, you know, tyrants or Democrats can do well or can do badly. It's not the nature of the system. It's the nature of the regime. So what, what that tells me to answer your question is if you're in power and you do well, good for you. If you're in power and you do badly, you're in trouble. And you know, if you're out of power, you, this may give you an opportunity uh, if the regime or uh, if the government of the day is seen to have to have bungled it. It makes sense. Um, I just wanted to remind people for a second, my audio wasn't working very well at the beginning, but if you click on the bottom where it says, ask a question, you can you can type in a question for Richard and then in you know, 15, 20 minutes when we open it up for questions, um, I can start asking those. So you can be doing the, that now if you like. Um, one more pandemic question. I mean, one of the great things about foreign affairs is that besides other countries looking to the US for an example, we can also look to, to other countries for, for examples. And I'm curious, like, um, Tom Friedman has compared the, he, he's talked about the the China model of a very strict crackdown versus the Sweden model of kind of a, a more liberal approach to coronavirus. But I'm curious what you what we can learn from other countries' approach to the coronavirus. And is there anything that you've seen done that's worth em emulating? No, I think there's a few. I mean, the best practices were not to wait before acting. Delay was incredibly costly for any country. So those who shut their borders early. To, ver to as much traffic as they could have done better. Uh, testing is critical as part of a response. Contact tracing, quarantining of those who are sick, wearing of masks, social distancing, washing hygiene, essentially all the things you know. And yeah. those who employed it early and comprehensively have done stunningly well. And those who have waited and have employed those tools sporadically have, uh, have paid an enormous price. It's a uh, we know, again, you know, who know, I don't know when there's going to be a vaccine. I don't even know if there'll ever be a vaccine. But we do have enough tools already to dramatically reduce the costs of the, of the virus. What's so frustrating and almost inexplicable is that these tools have not been employed 
uh, widely uh, in this country and in several and in others. And every country that has not employed the tools wide, uh, widely is paying is is paying a price. I thought there, there's another point that you make in the book that I thought was really interesting. You you raised the prospect of um, you talk about non-communicable diseases. That there's so much. There's a lot of focus. I mean, this is terrible, and there's a lot of focus on pandemics. But there are non-communicable diseases that we're spending pennies on the dollar. There's twice as many deaths as infectious diseases. Can you talk a little bit about that, Chris? Yeah. Look, I've been in this business now for over 40 years. But one of the you know, one of the many things I learned in writing this book was the details about this. Right. There's infectious diseases. Ebola, SARS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, obviously COVID-19, the regular flu. And then there's non-infectious diseases. Technically, they're known as non-communicable diseases, NCDs. And that's things like uh, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. What's so interesting is uh, a lot of these diseases, not all of them, but a lot of them are lifestyle related. Things like smoking, alcoholism, drug, sedentary lifestyle, overeating, what have you. Uh, Six of the seven, if I'm, I've got my numbers right, of the uh, the largest causes of death in the world come from these diseases. There's been a, if you will, an epidemic or even a pandemic in these. Again, it's not infectious, but it's a pattern, and we see it in rich and poor countries alike. Uh, and it's been growing every year. And as you correctly said, Kevin, virtually none, really a negligible amount, of the aid and the money that goes into dealing with. Uh, with disease around the world and public go, goes to deal with these diseases. I'm worried, again, uh, we need to do more about the pandemic. I'm worried that this experience will reinforce that trend. And again, we've got to walk and chew gun at the same time. We've got to deal with not just COVID-19. We have to deal with the likelihood there'll be a COVID, what, 22 or 25? This is not a one-off. We have to deal with the possibility that one day some bacteria will emerge that's resistant to antibiotics. So we, we do have to deal with uh, infectious disease, but we've also got to deal with all these uh, non-infectious or non-communicable diseases. They are enormous killers in this country and around the world. Okay. I mean, not, not to be too much of a downer at 7.30 p.m. On a, on a Thursday night, but I mean, but aside from all this, the post-World War II liberal order created by the great, you know, the wise men of foreign affairs, Dean Acheson and George Kennan, is clearly coming apart at the seams, it seems like to me. And I'm curious what, you know, how much of this do you think is big kind of structural things, impersonal forces, the rise of China and India, and how much is self-inflicted? How much is just, you know, statesmen who are abdicating this traditional American role? It's a big question. I think just to go back a little bit, I think it's important to say that for the last 70, 75 years, We've done pretty well in the world. We've avoided a great power conflict. Uh, we've had other conflicts, I understand, but we've avoided a great power conflict, avoided anything remotely on the scale of a World War I or World War II. Uh, prosperity has increased in the United States and around the world in an, to an unprecedented degree. And even though we're facing, facing this awful health challenge now, the, the average person is living far, far longer than one or two generations ago. This has been a remarkable period of history. Many more people are free, and, uh, uh, living in democracies, independence for a lot of places that were formerly colonies, uh, new technologies that have improved the quality of our lives. Here we are on uh, doing what we're doing here. If a pandemic had struck, we were talking about this before, you, Paige and I, if a uh, pandemic like this had struck the United States 25 years ago, we wouldn't have had any of this. And talk about the economy grinding to a halt. It would have been far, far worse than what we're uh, experiencing now. So I say all this just to say this has been a pretty good run in history. But you're right. Uh, it is uh, wearing thin. A couple of reasons. A lot of the institutions are uh, even older than I am, which means they're really old. They were created right after World War II, and they were never meant. It was unrealistic to anticipate things. And they haven't, they haven't kept up. We've got a lot of new challenges that there aren't institutions for, or they're very, uh, very weak. You do have things like changing power balances, the rise of China uh, being uh, one. Uh, so you got all these things. But I think the, the critical one, and you alluded to it, is the United States, which was, uh, I would describe as the chief architect and the general contractor of the world for 75 years, 
we've increasingly uh, decided that we want to retire from the job. And we've backed away. Uh, it began slightly under the previous administration. It has accelerated dramatically under the current one. We've seen it with uh, all the withdrawals from international arrangements, pulling troops back, questioning alliances, criticizing arrangements and institutions. Uh, this, in this, this administration has a funny amalgam of uh, isolationism and unilateralism. Uh, but what's happening is uh, this, this, this world system, this world order that worked not perfectly, but pretty well, is, getting, uh, is beginning to unravel. There's nothing to put in its place, and it, it, won't, it won't thrive without us. It's not self-sustaining. And so I don't think we've passed the point of no return, but all the lights are flashing yellow. And again, it won't sort itself out by itself. It will take the United States, not unilaterally, but working with others to build new arrangements, repair some old ones, uh, reinforce alliances, and, and so forth. Uh, I hope we do it. Because if we don't, I kind of come back to where we began, we will pay an enormous price here at home. We cannot insulate ourselves from a world that gets uh, increasingly disorderly. We will pay a price here in what comes at us, and we'll pay a price, for example, in our inability to do certain kinds of investing or traveling or trading or, or what have you. So uh, we have an enormous stake in the quality of the world, if you will. But at the moment, we're doing nothing. We're, we're, we've stopped investing in it. Good. Um, you touched on this um, in what you were just saying. Um, you, you sometimes hear it said said that both President Obama and President Trump, although they're they're temper they're temperamentally very different, they both bear some responsibility for this. You know, this withdrawal from the world. And is that is that fair? Is that a fair criticism? I think. Only up to point, I think President Obama, I was quite critical of him for things like saying there was a red line in Syria, then not acting on it, getting involved in Libya, and then, then lead, ne never following it up. But his sins of, if you will, omission, uh, largely in the Middle East, uh, pale in significance. Uh, this administration has basically had a, a repeated assault on alliances, has pulled out of, what, 10 or 12 regional and global uh, agreements, so I think it's a qualitative difference. So I do think it's uh, it's unfair to pair them or group them. Uh, basically, I would say every American president in the modern era, and that's basically Harry Truman, who became uh, president just before the uh, end of World War II in Europe and then Asia in 45, through Barack Obama. Uh, to use a football analogy, you remember football it was a game we used to play and we went to stadiums <laughs> and all that kind of uh, I would say every American president, whether they were a Democrat or Republican, and I work for four of them, both Democrats and Republicans, I think they played the game within the 40-yard lines. They disagreed on some issues, but they accepted the importance of the basic World War II and post-World War II institutions. They worked with American alliances. They were active diplomatically and so forth. Donald Trump is the first president not to buy into that. He is not. He's playing the game very much from one side of the field or even an end zone. Now, that's, a, that's an observation. If you think that's great, then you would say, good for him. And if you think that uh, it's a big mistake, you'd obviously be critical. What I think we can't, uh, though, ignore is that he is a departure. And I think a radical departure from American farm, for, from basically the, the thread of American foreign policy that I would argue for 75 years was an enormous return on uh, on investment in the world. What do you think of President Biden's foreign policy would look like? Well, again, uh, you don't know what it would be. Uh, yeah, he, but I think he is much more like the people I've described. I think he would, uh, his instincts are again within the 40 yard lines based upon uh, what he did when he was vice president based upon his record in the Senate. Uh, so I think in that sense, he's, he's recognizable I would say there are two things uh, if he were to become president. Uh, one is it's a daunting inbox in the world. The world, the pre who's ever president in January of uh, 2021, he'll have to make an enormous decision right away about what to do about the expiring new SALT nuclear arms control agreement with, uh, between the United States and Russia. All sorts of questions about, you know, the Middle East is still the least structured, least stable part of the world. We could just go around. Uh, every problem with uh, 
increasingly friction-filled relationship with China, North Korea's nukes and missiles, Iran, they'll be up to no good. Venezuela is hemorrhaging people. We, you know, climate change is proceeding apace. Talk about a, a, a terrible inbox. And who's ever the new president, whether it's or Mr. Trump in his second term or Mr. Biden uh, taking the job, the country will be very much like it is now in a sense that we'll still be feeling, I believe, the experience in, that, in present tense, the pandemic, will be in a world what I describe as managed risk. We will not be in a post-pandemic uh, environment in the United States. We'll still be in it. We will, uh, right now there's 42 million Americans out of work. By then maybe there'll be 30 million Americans out of work, but in no way will the economy have recovered to where it was say six months ago before the pandemic uh, hit our shores. I would think that a lot of uh, the country will still be very politically divided. This is going to be a bitterly fought election. Whoever loses is going to be extremely angry about the outcome, may not accept it. We could have all sorts of problems in our streets. So I would just think that this combination of a daunting inbox and a country facing you know, health and economic and political problems, that's going to be an extraordinarily tough hand. So even if what, even if a, a Joe Biden, if he were to become president, were inclined to do certain things, he's going to, again, it's, a, it's, it's as tough as a hand as you can imagine. Right. And, and one of the most you know, difficult cards to play, of course, is um, climate change. You've said it's a, um, it could be the defining issue of the 21st century. You've said it's a national security issue. How is it a national security issue? In what ways? Well, in all sorts of ways. Uh, we're beginning to see it as a, a generator of instability. Uh, refugees, climate refugees are becoming increasingly numerous and common. It's a threat to the uh, economic livelihood of uh, countries. Uh, in our own country, it's going to force people probably out of coastal uh, areas or enormously expensive to try to uh, uh, keep them there. So anything that affects stability, uh, you know, the storms, the floods, uh, it's going to have real implications. Also, obviously, for how our military operates, a lot of bases are going to be made uh, unusable. But, but the main reason is I think it will be an enormous economic drag, an enormous humanitarian uh, drag, and it will threaten the uh, stability of countries. Just think about what it was like, what, 12 months ago, those fires in Australia, the fires in, La and in Los Angeles. So th imagine that every year it gets slightly worse, which it will. Imagine the implications of that. And the reason, the other reason will have an impact on national security. If we're coping with that, it's going to be very hard for us to come up with the bandwidth to focus on the world. Again, it's, it's almost something you'd have to add to what we're going through now. Uh, farm, it'll increase the sense that foreign policy is discretionary or a luxury we can't afford just at a time that global issues are dominant. It's the worst possible time to have that mindset. But I'm worried if domestic challenges get worse, Kevin, that'll be exactly the, the argument. Right. Scary, scary stuff. Um, it's 10 after eight. So I want to um, just uh, open it up to some questions here. And I see there are a few coming in. You can type them right at the bottom where it says, ask a question and I'll just read them to Dr. Haas. Um, this is a good question. And you, I also noticed in the book, you have a great kind of appendix in there of further reading. It's things, it's, uh, you know, people are always asking what, you know, where can you find good information about foreign affairs? And you have some suggestions in the book. And the question is, um, it says, your book is premised on the notion that a lot of younger people don't appreciate or understand history and how we got to where we are today. Given that a lot of people on this webcast have kids who won't be engaged in their usual summer activities, besides your book, what are, what are three to five other books, movies, essays you would recommend they read this summer to help understand what's changing and how they can make for a better future? I'll answer it in 30 seconds, but let me just make one other pitch. One thing I'd love parents to do is look at the curriculum in their kids' high schools and colleges and basically start asking questions. I think it's wrong that most young people graduate either high school or college and do not study anything about the world. In most high schools, it's not offered. In most colleges and universities, it's offered but not required. And I just think uh, a young person, essentially now, anyone who's in school now, he or she will have been born around the beginning of the century. 
will essentially have a 21st century life. And the idea that they're leaving what will be the majority of their educational experience unprepared and not informed about the world seems to me fundamentally wrong. I would probably add something about non-informed about their own country's political heritage as well, civics. But part of, so part of my pitch is that parents, uh, particularly if you're spending all that money on an education, why not, why not demand that it were, that it prepare your son or daughter or whoever for the world that's going to so affect their lives. Look, I think this summer, one thing that would be really valuable would be to get a young person on his or her tablet or whatever electronic device they use to start reading at least one newspaper regularly, a New York Times, a Wall Street Journal, a Financial Times, a Washington Post. One of the major newspapers that really covers, well, I think that'd be a, an unbelievably good habit to uh, inculcate. There's a couple of really good magazines. The Probably the best weekly for this is The Economist. Again, uh, very well written, covers the entire uh, world. There's monthlies like the, or another weekly is the New Yorker, but that's a much broader thing. Uh, our magazine, Foreign Affairs, comes out um, every two months, but the website has a fresh piece every day. Foreignaffairs.com is an extraordinary uh, resource. I can say it because I have the piece tomorrow morning, so I'm totally comfortable uh, bragging on it. It's actually all about your opening questions. It's the, about the relationship between what goes on inside a country and its, its, its behavior and influence in the world. Uh, our, res our website, another place I would send people, forget that I happen to be the president of the Council on Foreign Relations. It is probably, though, the best website in the world about the world. And we have all sorts of educational resources to teach non-experts about the world. We call it World 101. But if people go to uh, CFR.org, Again, it's an incredibly useful uh, resource. In terms of reading books, a lot depends upon how, where they are. I'd almost say any history, biography. A lot of people this summer are reading uh, the new Churchill biography. You can never go wrong reading uh, uh, Churchill. My, one of my favorite books uh, is a book called Thinking in Time. And it's how you, you, how you use history in order to argue and to analyze. Uh, the, the subtitle, I think, is something like The Use of History for, by uh, Decision Makers. Uh, it's a wonderfully uh, written uh, book. But, you know, any of the books by Barbara Tuckman, I think, are fantastic. Yeah, I think in some ways the, the great books, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Michael Beschloss, John Meacham. We have a whole generation of, um, or past generations, of, of, of historians who basically write as good as uh, any novelist. Uh, Margaret, Mac Margaret McMillan, her work on the First World War. Uh, so there's there's so many good books out there. And actually, I talk about a lot of them, both in the course of the, in each chapter, the extra resources, and then at the end. Uh, but there's a lot out there. But I think the best thing to first start would be just to get into the habit of uh, checking in about the world. And the best way to do it is through a daily newspaper on its website. So we have another question about um, China. We haven't talked about China policy, and you you, you wrote in the book that um you know it could be we could be we could see a, another uh, a, we, we could refer to this period as the inter Cold War era between right. the period of U.S. Um, Soviet Cold War and the period of U.S. China Cold War. But the question is, given the increasing friction between the U.S. and China, do you think Graham Allison's book Destined for War? provides useful guidance for avoiding military conflict with China through engagement, finesse, and pragmatism. So China policy. Look, th there's a possibility of a U.S.-Chinese Cold War. It would be terrible for both countries and terrible for the world. This is the most important relationship of this century. If the German, French, British relationship dominated the first half of the last century, then it was the U.S.-Soviet. Now it's the U.S.-China. And our, if we're in a Cold War with China, not only is that expensive and dangerous, but we won't be able to do things like corral North Korea or deal collectively with climate or, or perhaps head off the next pandemic. So if it can be avoided, it, it, it ought to be. And to me, the definition of a good relationship is where we, we understand we're competitive. We understand we disagree on important issues. And can we design the relationship so even though we are competitive and even though we disagree, we can still cooperate where our interests happen to overlap, say on climate or on North Korea. 
that'll take a lot of pretty talented diplomacy on both sides. It's 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 very hard to have a, a relationship that you can't uh, easily describe or put in one box. But that's what that's actually what we what we uh, need. So is a Cold War possible? Sure. Both sides could mishandle the relationship, but both sides would pay an enormous uh, price. But I, I'm still mildly upbeat. It's hard, though, because the economics that for the last 20 or 30 years provided the rationale for the relationship now mainly provide friction. So I think we've got to figure out how to restructure the economic relationship somewhat uh, on terms that both of us can live with. I'd say one other thing. If we want China to behave better, and hopefully we can avoid a, a Cold War, we, it's not something we should tackle on our own. We have all these partners and allies. Let's use them, for God's sakes. Japan, South Korea, Australia, India is a partner, all these countries in Europe. We should band together and basically set rules for international relations that we want China to live up to when it comes to trade when it comes to how it acts beyond its borders. That's something we could do. We are throwing away our greatest form of leverage, which are uh, the force multipliers that, that our allies are. Okay. Um, we've got another question here. The question is about democracy movements. Has the US paid a price for not always supporting democracy movements and often supporting dictators? Going forward, should we shift more exclusively to supporting democracies and democratic movements. In a sense, we're still making up for Wilson's failure to make the world safe for democ democracy and knuckling under to the empires. That's the question about democratization. Well, during, during the Cold War, we were often uh, inconsistent. And the criticism's valid that uh, we often su supported non-Democrats simply because they were anti-communist. And most of the time that didn't work out so well in the long run. They uh, didn't have popular uh, support. I think democracies are worth supporting for two reasons. One is we believe in it as a matter of principle. Uh, we believe in rights. I also think the American people will feel a connection. Also, there's a lot of uh, pretty good literature in the field that established democracies tend to not only behave better towards their own people, but they behave better towards their neighbors. They're less violent, less likely to go to war. Now, that doesn't mean, though, I think we, I just sort of, my corollary or asterisk, we got to be smart about it. We can't confuse democracies with elections. Elections, I would say, are one dimension of a democracy, often late in the process. We ought to be supporting uh, independent sources of power within a society, what we, you, know, you and I would call civil society, organizations. We ought to support rights, principles. Uh, and we, gotta, we have to understand it has to, it'll often take time. It's not going to be a one-size-fits-all mold. Uh, different countries are going to adapt democratic procedures and principles and institutions for their own traditions. But yeah, all things being equal, it's in our interest. We just got to go about it in a in a careful and uh, as a, a previous president once said, in a somewhat humble way. There's there's nothing harder in this business than trying to influence the internal makings or trajectory of another society. Hard enough to influence their foreign policy. But influence their internals. That is really, really uh, tough. And unless we really understand that society, its traditions, its values, uh, we will probably make a bad situation worse. And indeed, uh, there's a couple of examples in the world where we have made bad situations worse. You you point out the fact too that that you know this this principle of non-interference that's been sort of part of the course since the 17th century. Um, is is changing now. Um, how, how is it? How is it changing? Yeah, as you as you say, in the 17th century, the idea grew up of sovereignty. The idea that countries ought not to invade one another, they ought not to get involved in one another's internal affairs. It was a kind of live and let live let system, and that was it was often violated by a lot of wars. But by and large, that was the principle of modern stability. Uh, we see it in our own age violated sometimes, Russia and Ukraine. We saw Saddam Hussein invade Kuwait 30 years ago. But by and large, we don't see too many invasions across borders. Uh, what's happened, though, in the modern era is while that's still important, there's now a, a complicating factor. And what we've learned is that stuff, to use a, a technical word we use in the foreign policy business a lot, that stuff that goes on inside a country's borders can still affect us. Think about it, 
the Taliban in Afghanistan allowed terrorists to train. So it was going on inside their borders, but obviously it was a threat to us. For now, we see it with China, with uh, what happened with the corona uh, virus. I mentioned before Brazil. Most of the Amazon rainforest is inside Brazil. So under a pure approach to sovereignty, you'd say, well, it's theirs to do what they will, except it will affect climate change dramatically, and that's going to affect us dramatically. Or if there's a, a genocide, it's not only horrific in terms of human terms, but it could cause all sorts of flows of refugees and the rest, which could destabilize parts of the world. So what we're, what we're seeing more and more is that while we need to respect sovereignty, because we don't want to have constant wars, we've also got to figure out a way that where there are exceptions. And particularly in those areas, when things are allowed to take place within a country's borders that affect others badly, they shouldn't be able to enjoy all the protection of sovereignty. This is a complicated thing, because the question is, how do we build a world where it's respected when it's good and it's potentially violated when it's not? Awfully tough to get the ground rules and then to come up with a system that enforces the rules. But I think that is going to be the challenge uh, or a challenge of 21st century foreign policy and diplomacy is how to deal with this double edged quality of sovereignty. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked about the Middle East and we have a question um, about the Kurds. Um, the question is, any comments on our abandoning of the Kurds in North Syria and how it's reflected on our international partners, particularly in the Middle East? Are the actions potentially reversible? It's a good question. Uh, look, the Kurds have been dealt a bad hand by history. When World War I ended and the peace conference happened uh, in France, the Kurds were expecting they too would get a state of their own. And it was almost the diplomatic equivalent of musical chairs. When the music stopped, all the chairs were filled and the Kurds did not get a state of their own. Instead, the Kurds found themselves living mainly in, in four states uh, in the region, in Syria, in uh, Turkey, uh, Iran, and Iraq. And they have often, uh, as a minority in all of those countries, they've often suffered uh, for it. And we've at times worked with them, when we particularly... Uh, when we disagreed with the government they found themselves in, but often we would abandon them. And that's what we did this time. We abandoned them uh, in, a, in a way that I thought was both uh, immoral as well as uh, strategically unwise, both locally. We lost a lot of leverage, but I thought it sent a terrible message to America's allies. Uh, and I know a lot of people thought just, again, when, the pre when President Obama didn't make good on his red line threat, a lot of allies got unnerved about what does that tell you about American credibility? And when we ditched the Kurds this time, when President Trump did that, abandoned the Kurds, it sent a terrible message. Uh, we may be doing something similar in Afghanistan. I fear that we uh, uh, are. Um, the Kurds, though, are incredibly resilient. And I can imagine once again, again, the United States working with them, that they might be mistrustful. We'll see if they want to, but I can imagine it. We may, uh, we may find reasons to, uh, we may find common cause. I'm not sure the Kurds, though, will ever get a state of their own because right now, again, all four of those countries, Iraq, Turkey, uh, uh, Iran, and Syria, violently oppose Kurdish secession and forming a state of their own. I think what probably the most they can hope for is uh, the, what I would call autonomy. The, the ability to live in peace and they're part of the country, follow their own religious practices, speak their own language, have their language taught in their schools. Uh, I think that's probably uh, a, the upside of their future. And, I, and I'd love to see them get it. And I think the United States should help them get it. Okay. Um, I, while we're on the Middle East, um, uh, Yemen um, is one of my favorite. When I was a foreign correspondent, one of my favorite places to go. A really charming country. Interesting. Yes, wasn't place. it beautiful? It's gorgeous. I mean, gorgeous, charming, interesting, um, but it, it's now possibly the world's greatest humanitarian disaster. And I'm, sure. I'm just curious how you how you see it playing out. That, that, that You're right. I mean, look, it is probably or one of the world's probably three great humanitarian disasters right now, along with Syria and um, Venezuela. Um, 
and I'm not quite sure how it comes to an end. And I think what the Saudis have done and continue to do to some extent, um, just truly misguided. Um, Yemen's got, though, its own internal problems. You know, uh, we could spend hours talking about it. I'm not sure I understand it well enough to talk about it intelligently. I think it's going to be tough. Sometimes those civil wars kind of burn out. And the Saudis, I think, would love to move on if they could get an outcome they could live with. Um, Iran has found it a useful uh, enterprise for a relatively small investment. They've been able to cause an awful lot of uh, difficulty for others. So my guess is it'll probably be a country in name only. Uh, you won't have a central government that'll control all parts of the country. You'll have all sorts of uh, various militias and organizations and this or that enclave for this or that. I think it's going to be a messy place for a long time. Hopefully, though, the level of uh, misery and fighting uh, will will go down. And But I don't think Yemen is going to be a, a normal place uh, anytime soon. I just, and I'm sorry to be pessimistic about it, but the degree of devastation. And uh, there's really so, the institutions just don't exist. So you know, one of the words, one of the phrases that became fairly controversial was nation building. This is a nation, it really, or state building. You really need to build the mechanics of a state. I worry one thing right now, Kevin, as bad as it is, I worry about the vulnerability of a society like that to a COVID-19. Yes. There's yeah. no public health infrastructure anymore. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, you almost feel it's cursed at times. And you know, you've been there. It really was uh you know, Sana, some of the cities were quite beautiful and the architecture was some of the most brilliant in the Middle East and it, it makes you weep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have another question. Um, uh, this is a good question about it. Uh, how concerned are you about disinformation, particularly on social media? What can be done about this without preventing the free exchange of very different ideas and perceptions? Yeah, uh, the question kind of gets at the problem. Uh, you've got a lot of disinformation and on the internet, you've got a lot of it in social media. These are basically, you, know, you you came out of a formal journalistic background and you had things called editors and you had fact checkers. Yeah. You know, we live in a world without editors and fact checkers now for the most part. There's all this stuff out there. There's no gatekeepers and there's actual, and there's governments and others who are consciously going out to distort things, putting out false information, uh, I think it's very hard to control. Do I think the companies could do a better job, the Facebooks and the Twitters? Yes. But at the risk of getting into hot water, I think it's very hard for them to police it and for them to be making judgments all the time. Uh, I think to some extent that's up to the political marketplace. Um, now, if it's foreign governments, it's a different thing. And if it's foreign governments mucking around in these things to, to affect our politics, I think there we have to find ways of reducing our vulnerability and even pushing back through sanctions or other tools. But if it's people in this country doing it, then um, the only defense I know against it, it's not censorship. It's a better education. It's uh, I want people to be able to discern that's nonsense. That's not true. This person saying this, this and that. I mean, conspiracy theories tend to thrive when people don't have the facts. And so, you know, one of the reasons I wrote this book, one of the reasons I'm so insistent about the quality of education is it's the only way I can think of, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's not going to be the answer. He's not going to, he and the people he employs, we can't expect them to every day make thousands of decisions or millions of decisions about what's accurate, what's not, what's fair, what's not. It ain't going to work that way. We have to make these decisions for ourselves. So we have to tool up. And I try to help in my own modest way. Um, but I think, again, the only thing that every American has in common with fellow Americans these days is that through K through 12, they go to public schools. Hopefully they stay longer. But that's why I put such a, an emphasis on the quality of public education. That's our best, that's our best defense uh, against what, uh, what you're discussing. Okay. We've got maybe five, seven more minutes um, to talk. So if you do have more questions, please um, type them in the bottom. Um, I, one of the things that struck me in the book is you write about um, the importance of individuals in foreign affairs. And we talked a little bit about this. Um, what are some of the examples of 
indispensable men and women um, in foreign affairs in modern history? Look, I've been lucky enough to work for four presidents. And my one takeaway, and it's an answer to your question, is that nothing's inevitable. The people who are there, whether it's in the Oval Office or wherever, who are making the big decisions, that's the stuff of history. So the person I was closest to out of the four presidents was the 41st president, George H.W. Bush. I worked for all four years in the White House. And the way, for example, he handled the end of the Cold War, the, the idea that it ended peacefully on our terms with the unified Germany inside NATO, that wasn't inevitable. Uh, history is filled with unraveling empires triggering wars. Look at World War I. We had several unravel, unraveling uh, empires. Look at what happened when Yugoslavia unraveled. The fact that this was handled the way it was, or when Saddam invaded Kuwait. Uh, the idea that it was axiomatic that we were going to build this international coalition of dozens of countries working through the UN to eject him from uh, Kuwait and then to have the discipline not to march on Baghdad. Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, and some of the people I work with there, I think, are the best. People like Brent Scowcroft, who I still think is the, the greatest national security advisor we've ever had. I work with Bob Gage, Jim Baker, Colin Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Dick Cheney was uh, Secretary of Defense. Pretty impressive crowd. As a crowd deal. I think the uh, I think the greatest of the post World War II foreign policy presidents and administrations, though, was uh, Truman's. You mentioned it before. It's kind of the dream team in some ways. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you think of an intellect like George Kennan, Dean Acheson, George Marshall, Truman himself, and Truman, by the way, probably had read more history than any other person entering the Oval Office, uh, since you asked about history before. Yeah. Uh, I think that was, and they were the most, you know, it's interesting, Acheson titled his memoir, Present at the Creation. Yeah, not the most modest title, though I've been told I'm not allowed to criticize people for immodest titles since I wrote a book called The World. But uh but it really was the creation. I mean, so much of this order that has served us well for 75 years grew up in, um, was born and launched in uh, the Truman, uh, the Truman era. I think there's been some other successful foreign policy presidents, but um, if I had to choose two, I would say Truman's um, kind of made the transition from World War II to the post World War II international order that we've benefited from. And then I think Bush, for the way he managed the end of the Cold War and the initial moments of the post-Cold War world. Those would be the two I would give the highest marks to. And people, one person, I have individuals. Uh, I mentioned Baker, I mentioned Scowcroft, mentioned Atchison and those people. The other person is obviously Kissinger. Kissinger, I know, uh, I would just say Henry, I think is the great scholar practitioner. When I was a young graduate student, I read his stuff and uh, it was powerful. And his, he's one, he's, he and Vigdan Brzezinski were probably the two great scholar practitioners of our time, that they were both first-rate academics uh, and then also able to operate. And there's very few people who are good in an academic setting and also good in a, in a government setting. And, uh, but Kissinger is sui generis, is unique in terms of uh, his ability to think conceptually yet still act operationally. Uh, we haven't talked about Europe. We have a question about Europe. Now that German Chancellor um, Angela Merkel has decided not to show at the G7 meeting, how likely is it that there will be a meeting? And, and can you comment, please, on what it, uh, is to come with our allies? It's a great question. Um, I don't know if there'll be a G7 meeting. If there is, I don't know what it'll accomplish. These meetings don't tend to accomplish all that much. They, they come and go. And the relations between and among uh, between the United States and the other members of the G7, shall we say, are strained. That's a diplomatic word. I think Merkel right now is much more focused on Europe. She saw the gradual weakening of the entire European project, the European Union, saw Brexit, saw the growing divide in Europe between the careful spendthrift northern countries and the more profligate southern countries. And what she and the French, what she and Emmanuel Macron have done is for the first time in quite a while, come up with a Franco-German initiative that's really big and imaginative. In this case, a big economic recovery plan for Europe to get them over the pandemic and the economic consequences of the pandemic. And it's the first time we're seeing some bold, creative policymaking coming out of Europe. And it almost gives a new lease on life 
for the European Union at a time around Brexit, not that, you know, that it looked like it was hanging on by a threat. So my, for Merkel right now, that's her focus. I think she's essentially written off this president. Uh, she and the others are waiting to see what the result of the election is and whether they feel they have an American president they can work with. Uh, but in the meantime, her focus is going to be very much on, on rebuilding Europe, basically it's trying to strengthen European institutions, which haven't kept up with the with the, the new challenges. Europe is it just hasn't progressed in a, in a balanced, orderly way. And there's big debates about the relationship between individual countries and, and Brussels. And what I think she wants to do is strengthen the hand of Brussels. And she and Macron have that pretty common vision. And I think that will be her focus, much, much more important to her than a meeting with Donald Trump that she fears won't accomplish a lot. And will, particularly two months before an election, she will be very wary, I would think, about doing something that would allow her to be used in any way for political purposes. Okay. Well, it's 8.37. Um, I, I don't, we don't want to keep you too long here, but maybe I'll ask one last question. We talked about some of your practical advice for, um, uh, for students, but I'm curious, what's your advice for, what advice would you give young people who are considering a career in foreign affairs? Uh, it's look, it, it's real. It's important. It's interesting. So uh, I hope there are some people. I, I worry that the best and the brightest are too interested in private equity, and I'd like a few of them to uh, think about uh, this. There's lots of ways to try it. Uh, you could go work in a campaign. You could go work for a can, uh, candidate. You could go uh, work for someone in Congress. You can do it through the academic path. You can take the path that you you so that were so successful with. There's a lot of opportunities in these non-governmental organizations. I mentioned the International Rescue Committee, a lot of organizations around the world dealing with refugees, health, uh, what, uh, what have you. I, there's so many different paths, business, you can do it. So I would basically say just get going in it and don't, don't, worry. I always, don't worry that your first job has to be your last. You'll probably have 20, 25 jobs in the course of your career. What you want to do is simply choose a, path, a job where you learn a lot. And the most important thing for young people in this or any field, in my experience, is that they have the ability to, you know, to, to think critically and to write well. If you can do that, you'll do fine. And you know, my view is my favorite background for anyone in this field is history uh, more than uh, anything else, uh, more than a language, more than uh, a skill, if you will, is, 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 is background. And you can always learn a lot of the details on the job. But I would basically say, uh, you know, just get going with anything. Don't worry so much about the first job and just, just choose jobs where you tool up. Uh, to me, the, the best early jobs are the jobs that stretch you the most and you walk away uh, you know, the most changed by. Okay. Great advice. Thank you, Dr. Haas. The book, um, if you haven't, Father's Day has come. Father's Day is what? Th two, three weeks away? Two, the yeah, world? Yeah. two weeks from this Sunday. Um, thanks very much um, for joining us. That was really interesting. I feel smarter after 45 minutes. So thank, thank you, you, Kevin. Thank you, Paige. And thank you. I just want to say good night from Barrett. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Richard. A real pleasure. Interesting conversation. And thank you to all of you. I know there's a lot of content out there, and we're very grateful that you joined us tonight. Thank you to the DCA again, and we wish you all a peaceful evening. Good night. Stay well.